Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, asking for your help, asking that you would be with us now as we look at thoughts from your word. We pray that you would help me uh, guard my lips, my tongue from error, and I just pray that we would receive what you have for us in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our text this afternoon, and I've titled this Confession and Prayer. James is writing this epistle to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, as we see in chapter 1, verse 2. In this epistle, he outlines the relationship between faith and works for Jewish Christians who no doubt were still heavily influenced by the Mosaic Law and a system of works. And you can hear the kinship in the tone in this epistle. James writes, my brethren or my beloved brethren, 11 times throughout the letter. And here at the end of the letter, he focuses on prayer. And I want to hone in on on verse 16 in particular this afternoon, although we'll also look at, at the local context. This is a very familiar passage, a very familiar verse to us. And in particular, this, this second part, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, that gets quoted a lot, and, and for good reason. Uh, but possibly, possibly at times at the expense of the first part, which tends to take a back seat. And in, in other words, it doesn't get as much attention as the second part. And so my goal this afternoon is to look at how, how the whole verse connects, how the second part and the first part, how, how it all connects. So confess your trespasses to one another. James is writing an exhortation, an imperative to confess or to verbally and openly communicate our offenses or sins to one another in the context of the local church. James doesn't go into specific detail of what this confession looks like or how it's carried out explicitly. But we can be reasonably sure that it's not meant for, you know, every Sunday we, we all come up in the front of the church and we, we open up our rap sheet of all, all the sins we committed over the past week. You know, I, you know, I, I disciplined my children in anger and I, I spoke a harsh word to my wife. I told a lie about this to cover up this. So we don't, we don't come up and publicly confess, you know, all the sins of the week every week to the church. Now, that said, there are times, there are times when there has been a public confession of sin in the church. And I, I, I do remember, and some of you may as well, over the past decades, of there have been several times where someone has openly, publicly confessed sin uh, to the church. You know, depending on how grievous it is or how it affects the whole church, uh, that is necessary sometimes. And that's a very unpleasant thing to be a part of, to witness, and of course, to have to do. But sometimes it's necessary. And so that public confession is included, I believe, here in this verse, although it's not typically the the typical outworking of what is intended in this verse, I believe. Confess your trespasses. So I believe this also doesn't involve, again, not coming up publicly, but perhaps to one person confessing all the sins that we've committed over the week. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Catholic Church and the practice of absolution, where one confesses their sins to a priest who has been given authority by the church, the Catholic Church, to absolve or forgive them of their sins. But why do we need such a peace? We, we have a great high priest, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we understand from Scripture, from places like Psalm 51, that ultimately we have sinned against God. And so whether or not we confess our sins to one another, we ultimately must confess our sins to God. In Christ we find forgiveness, and I am so thankful for that. But Scripture does instruct us, as we see here in James 5, 16, to confess our trespasses to one another, to each other. So after what we've just considered, we can be reasonably certain that this is talking about specific trespass, specific sins that we have committed against each other. And what are these trespasses? The word, the word here for trespass is not that missing the mark word that we typically associate with sin, but it's similar in meaning. It's used in Scripture quite often. And, and both those words, the trespasses and sins, are seen in Ephesians 2.1, where it says we are dead in trespasses and sins. So it's those two different types of misdeeds that we're talking about. And this, this word has to do with unintentional and intentional uh, misdeeds. And the literal meaning is like a false step. So there are many different ways we can, we can sin against each other and, and harm and hurt one another. But uh, James puts quite an emphasis on the tongue. And we see that here in the letter, throughout the letter, exhorting his readers to be slow to speak in chapter 1, verse 26, or verse 19. He warns against not bridling our tongue in verse 26. He spends the majority of chapter 3 warning us about the dangers of the untamable tongue. Right? No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And in chapter 4, verse 11, James exhorts us not to speak evil of one another. So there's quite an emphasis here on this particular type of trespass, what comes out of our mouth. And a lot of times what comes out of our mouth there can be intentional sin, and there can be unintentional sin. So regardless of what type, though, of sin or transgression is committed, I believe it's important to point out that these are, these are things, these are sins that are known or may be known to both parties. In other words, if I'm having bad thoughts about brother so-and-so, you know, I'm not going to go up to him and confess, hey, brother, I was thinking this about you, and I was thinking this about you. Right, and I hope, I hope we're not doing that because that's not really helpful. Right? They didn't know I was thinking those thoughts. I certainly wouldn't want someone to come up to me and just unload. Oh, I was thinking all these things about you. So it's not really. It's more harmful than helpful. And so those those things must be confessed to God. Right? Those our thoughts are between us and God, and so we we confess those thoughts to God in the secrecy of our prayer closet. Also, there, there is no need to confess to each other sins that do not pertain directly to each other. In other words, sins of the heart. So sins that, I mean, perhaps different things that we're dealing with that, you know, maybe I haven't committed that against someone, but those are things that are in the heart that I'm dealing with. Um, perhaps it would be appropriate to do so with a, a spouse or, or a trusted counselor, a pastor. But if I haven't committed that against someone, then there's really no need to confess that to someone. We have to be very careful with confession because the sharing of information can be an opportunity for sin, for slander, for allegations, gossip. Perhaps you've heard the saying, the circle of confession should be no larger or smaller than the circle of known transgression. It's not a Bible verse. But it is based on some biblical principles that can help us work out what this confession looks like practically. So this is to openly, not necessarily publicly, but openly between two persons acknowledge a sin that's been committed. Again, without, without reservation, without holding something back, it's honestly confessing this sin in private. Jesus prescribes in Matthew 18 that if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
alone. This is very important. Uh, but sometimes a step can, can be skipped. Um, offenses should be first handled between those two parties alone and no one else. Even if there's other people privy to the matter, they, they can be updated as needed. But it should, it should happen between those two parties alone. As a side note, it's, it's interesting that in Matthew 18, you have the offended going to the offender for reconciliation. Here in James 5.16, you have the offender instructed to go and confess to the offended. So no matter what side of the offended line you're on, we must reconcile. We must confess and restore the relationship. But again, going back to the idea of that circle of confession, it needs to be kept as small as possible because one ins- w- once information's out there, you can't, you can't bring it back, right? It's out there, it's going to do damage. Unnecessarily so. And so there's an opportunity for sin. And that's not the point of confession. The point of confession is reconciliation and a restoration of fellowship. And this is aided by prayer. So, so James says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. So his exhortation in this passage reminds us of the responsibility for all of us to lift one another up before the throne of grace, to intercede for one another. Each member should pray for one another, bear each other's burdens, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Right? We understand this, and, and to be able to pray for one another in the way that James is talking about here assumes that we've developed some personal relationship. We know each other. Right? This was the norm in that day, and it should be the norm in this day as well. If we aren't involved in each other's lives and are gathering together regularly and taking advantage of you know, fellowship opportunities, and it can be easy, and I'm speaking to myself here too, it can be easy to overlook or be unaware of the, the different needs, the different ways that we can be praying for each other. And of course, nowadays we have you know, emails and texts and a lot of you know, other ways that we can communicate but per- personal relationships cannot live on virtual means alone. So just as confession is to openly acknowledge, uh, verbally acknowledge our sin to one another, I believe prayer, as instructed in this verse, is, is linked in the same manner. In other words, I think we can, we can all agree that as Christians, we, we should pray for one another. And we should do that daily and praying in our you know in our prayer closets alone with god that that should be a a given i think that's fair to say that's a given but when was the last time you verbally prayed for someone or prayed with someone when's the last time i did that there i believe there's something uniquely special when we verbally pray for one another and I don't just mean prayer meetings, but just coming alongside someone and praying for them, especially when there's a need, especially when, especially when there's an offense and something must be confessed. I believe it, that brings us closer and closer fellowship. Now, praying at all can be, can be difficult, right? We, you know, you know, one might say, well, we don't really have, there's no time, we're so busy, you know, to, we can't make time to come together and, and pray. So there's a lot of things that, hinder us you know the evil one the evil one certainly does not want us to come together and pray he wants to divide us and he knows that if we come together and pray for one another that you know there is going to be power there so and we have the flesh that distracts us so it's hard enough to pray when relationships are healthy already but what about when a brother or sister has trespassed against you it is one of the hardest things in the world to pray for, so to intercede for someone when they've offended you. Why is it so hard? Well, because we're hurt. And the last thing we want to do when someone has sinned against us is to go before our Father in heaven to intercede for them. All right, our flesh is hurting, and perhaps we want, or perhaps our flesh wants retribution to get even. We may even become like Jonah, who didn't want to preach to Nineveh because he knew God was going to have mercy, right? And when two people come together and pray for one another, 
right? Healing is going to occur. That's a promise. And so, so it's difficult, but it's necessary. We must confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. And that's the main purpose of confession, to pray for one another so we can come to a place of restoration and reconciliation. When we listen to someone confess their faults, we must be focused on turning it into a matter of prayer, not, not holding that against them, you know, not tucking that in the back of your mind, oh, okay, now I know this about this person, right? <clears throat> it's a matter of prayer, and between you alone. You know, we don't, uh, we don't pick up the phone and, you know, call, call a friend and, can you please pray for this brother? He's struggling with this, or he did such and such to me. Or, you know, that's just an opportunity for gossip, right? So it's a matter of prayer, and we need to be mature. We need to be uh, sensitive to those things that are confessed. Galatians 6.1 gives a warning. He says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. It's a hard thing to confess our faults to one another. That's hard. It takes humility. But there's healing that's promised. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So this is the reason, and I've alluded to this already, but this is the reason for James' exhortation to confess and pray. The word for healing here is generally used for physical healing, but can also be interpreted as spiritual healing. Here's where the passage has been difficult for some, including myself. Because if you're if you just look at verse 16, the healing there seems to refer to a spiritual healing. We're talking about sins, we're talking about offenses. It seems like a spiritual healing is what's being uh, communicated. But the passage that we read from verse 13 seems to indicate there is physical healing taking place, or it's talking, or James is talking about physical healing, right? We see the word suffering, sick, afflicted. So what does all this mean, how, and how does this fit in? Well, I certainly do not have the final word on this. I believe it's important when coming to difficult passages that we, uh, that are not clear that we are careful about adopting a dogmatic position. So please keep that in mind as we just, I'm just going to lay out some observations. In verse 13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? That word suffering has the idea of suffering evil, enduring affliction, or experiencing painful hardship. So this is referring to someone who is undergoing suffering hardship. And this experience could include a physical illness. could. But I don't believe that's the primary meaning here. The same word, the same idea is used in verse 10, where he says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So there's the idea of undergoing hardship. And James seems to contrast this idea with the next phrase. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. I don't believe the contrast is those who are ill with those who are healthy, but rather those who are experiencing trials with those who are cheerful. And that's the contrast. Next, in verse 14, we see the word sick. Is anyone among you sick? When we think of sick today, we think, <laughs> we've had a lot of sickness going around. We think of disease, right? Bacteria, viruses, <laughs> And there are a number of, there are quite a number of Greek words, actually, that are translated sick, that describe, and they describe illness more of a, as a condition. Um, and the ones that are the closest approximation to our understanding are, for example, in Matthew 4, 23. This has two words that have to do with being diseased or that condition. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, among the people. And those aren't the words used here in James. 
And there's also another word in Luke 5.31, we see a word for sick that has to do with being miserably afflicted, where Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So that's another word for a malady, but that's not the word, none of these words are the word for sick here in James. The word for sick here in James is also translated sick in the gospel, but it has the idea of being feeble or weak or without strength. In John 5, verse 3, it describes those such as the impotent man who had, the infir- who had an infirmity for 38 years who was not able to step into the pool of Bethesda for healing. When the angel stirred the waters, you remember the story. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. There's the word, impotent. Of blind, halt, withering, waiting for the moving of the water. So this seems to be the condition of one who is described by this word for sick. And this comes out in the context. We see that the one who is sick is exhorted to call for the other's church. In other words, they are not able to, it implies they're not able to go to them, but that the elders must come to them. And let them, the elders, pray over him, implying that the, the one being described as sick is in a prone position, perhaps bedridden. It's a serious condition as the elders pray over him. Now verse 14 also says, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now much has been made of the anointing of oil that's talked about. We know this is not the holy anointing oil spoken of in Leviticus 8, which was administered upon the priests and used in the context of marking the tabernacle and the furnishings as set apart and holy unto the Lord. In Exodus 30, God commands that this composition of oil should not be poured on man's flesh. So we know it's not this particular oil or this particular composition. And I say composition because oil, presumably olive oil, was a major part of culture in the ancient Near East and even today and was frequently mixed with fragrances and spices for various uses, uh, like in the context of hospitality. Uh, like we see in Luke 7, 46. Oil was used in the context of healing as well. Like we see in Luke 10, 34, where the Samaritan pours oil on the wounds of the man spoken of in the parable. Also in Mark six thirteen, it says of the twelve, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now it's important though, just now as an observation, the oil was not we don't really see it used in a strictly medicinal sense. Again, the Samaritan, he used the oil for physical wounds, not for, you know, a cold or, or the flu or something. And also in the, the context of Mark 16, or 6.13, there's supernatural, miraculous healing taking place. And so oil would not be used there in a medicinal sense. It's a, it was a supernatural or miraculous healing that was taking place. <clears throat> So, back to James, the oil, again, just an observation, but the oil doesn't seem to be used in a consecrative way or a medicinal way. It's likely, likely that it was a physical act that symbolized a spiritual reality. Just as oil was used to refresh and rejuvenate a weary guest, like a dinner guest, a wedding guest, the Lord is the one who can truly refresh our spirit and revive our hearts. And so was used in the context of one who was feeble, without strength, as described by sick here in this passage. So since this use of oil was so closely tied to culture, I believe that the the usages of oil are likely descriptive, not prescriptive. So some some use oil today in, in this context for healing. But there's no explicit command to, you know, use, use the oil or not to use the oil. And so that's, why, that's one of the things that made this difficult. Uh, because of just the many different ways oil is used and the context and the, and the culture. But o- notice that the oil is ultimately secondary. It's not the primary thing. It's secondary. It's not the oil that cures this person, right? 
Verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now there are a number, just another observation, there are a number of words that James could have used to denote healing. But it doesn't say the prayer of faith will heal the sick. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now it's interesting. The word save here is the same word as used in Matthew 121, for he shall save his people from their sins. In fact, this is the main usage of this word in the New Testament, to, to save, to deliver, to rescue. When it is used in the context of healing, but it's associated with faith, like in Matthew 9, 22, where the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and Jesus says to her, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. There's that word there. <clears throat> so I believe James being guided by the Holy Spirit as he writes this, I believe he's using these words intentionally. Because again, there's many different words he could have used. But I believe he uses this word to include not just physical healing, but spiritual healing as well. And I would even go as far as say primarily spiritual healing, though that does not mean there's not a physical component. Now what do I mean by that? <clears throat> there is a parallel passage that we're familiar with in 1 Corinthians 11, where those who partook of the bread and cup partook in an unworthy manner. And Paul says in verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 11, For this reason many are weak, there's our word in James, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. So the source of the issue was a spiritual concern, but there were physical consequences. <clears throat> Again, in James, note that a physician is not called, or someone known to have a gift of healing, but the elders of the church are called, implying that pastoral or elder care is required. And notice that there appears to be a promise stated here. It is not the prayer of faith may save the sick, and the Lord may raise him up. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. This is assured. And so here's where we find some tension, right? And some may struggle with this. I've struggled with this passage because we know God heals. We know God heals physically. Does God care about our physical healing in our bodies? Yes. Yes, he does. And this was a huge part of Jesus' ministry here on earth. His ministry was full of mercy and compassion and physical healing. But here comes the next question. Does God promise physical healing on this earth? Does he promise it? Not does he do it, because we know he does it. But does he promise it? Many faith healers take this passage and, and run with it, right? And you have all the faith healing garbage that's out there. But we know that it, it isn't always God's will that someone will be physically healed, right? We know that. The Apostle Paul, for example, prayed three times for deliverance from his infirmity, and he was not healed. Do we think Paul didn't pray earnestly enough, fervently enough? Do we think God, Paul didn't ask in faith without doubting? Of course. And there are loved ones that we know, those we know, with a grievous illness like cancer, for example, that we have prayed for fervently that God would heal them, but he did not. Does that mean we should just give up praying for those who are sick? No. If it is God's will for a person to be temporarily, and that's important, temporarily physically healed, he will do it through means that he has provided. And prayer is one of those means. So the question we must ask is not whether we should pray for healing. Prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian. That's that's on Matt. It's a given. But the question is, do we trust him with the outcome? Now notice Notice the next phrase. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Some point to this and say that this statement confirms that the verse, of, the verse is primarily talking about physical healing. And oh, by the way, if this person has sinned, he'll be forgiven. As if somehow detached from the verse. But rather, I believe this statement connects connects the verses, verse 15 and verse 16. 
the prayer or the promise of, of forgiveness has stated here, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So the promise of forgiveness here cannot be granted if the prayer of faith that's spoken about is only about physical healing. Now again, I'm not saying this person is not experiencing some kind of physical condition, but this prayer of faith goes beyond the physical and goes to the root of the issue, which may be unconfessed or repentant or unrepentant sins. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, now, that word therefore is not in the text, in the New King James, but it is, I believe, the idea is in other translations. The ESV, I believe, has therefore. Therefore, confess. So this connection between unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sins have a physical consequence. We see that in Psalm 32. Verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. But then in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Brethren, we are not promised temporary physical healing but we are promised forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Therefore, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This, this is the second half. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Again, this, this second half often gets plucked out of the immediate context sometimes and applied in a different number of ways, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a familiar and powerful promise that stands on its own. But what does it mean in the immediate context of confess your trespasses and pray for one another? I don't believe James switches gears here, talking about confession and prayer and then just adding on this truth for good measure. Now, we know as James was first penning these words, he didn't organize them into the verses we have today. That, that came centuries later. But I believe the verses were put together with careful thought. And it's put together for a reason. I mean, this again, this, this statement uh, could be applied in a number of different ways, and it could, have, it could have been anywhere. It could have been after verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Right, But it's here in verse 16 that we find this promise. <clears throat> now the way, the way the Greek is translated to English here can make it sound to some perhaps that the word fervent is the key word in this, in this statement. But consider, consider the literal translation, which is very strong is the petition of one righteous being made effective. Or the prayer of a righteous one has great strength having been made effective. The ESV translates it this way, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So I believe the word righteous is the key word here in this passage. Now, don't misunderstand me. Should our prayers be fervor, fervent? Yes, they should be fervent. They should not be coldly robotic and ritualistic and without any emotion. They should be our honest and open expression before our Father. But at the same time, we should be careful not to trust in the level of our fervency as to whether or not God will hear and answer us. And I do not believe that's what James is driving at here. God hears and answers us based on being righteous. Consider Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. The righteous. So who are the righteous? There is none righteous. No, not one, right? We know that. We cannot be righteous in and of ourselves. We know our righteousness are as filthy rags. We need Christ. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. We are only deemed righteous 
because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And this describes all those who follow Christ and trust in him. So what can keep a righteous man's prayers from being effective? One way this can happen is when there is unconfessed sin, right? The psalmist says in Psalm 66, if I regard or cherish iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. How can we expect God to hear us when we've sinned against another brother? There's unconfessed sin against another child of God. Or we're bitter because someone has sinned against us and we're holding that against them. We're, we're dwelling on it. We're cherishing it. We're regarding it. Right? <clears throat> Jesus exhorts in Matthew 6, 23, that if we bring our gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, first, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. It's so important that we confess our sins to one another, that there is a mutual confession and mutual prayer. We pray for one another so that healing can take place and that we can once again worship together. Brethren, there are some wounds, there are some wounds that go deep and reconciliation seems out of reach. But here's the promise. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The prayer of faith has the power to restore broken relationships and bring healing. I fear that in the context of the local church, some believers are at times too content to let relationships remain in a broken state. And so is it any wonder then if our prayers don't seem like they're being answered, like they don't seem like they're going past the ceiling? Is there unconfessed sin? Is there broken relationships? James gives us an illustration in verse 17 of the prophet Elijah. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. King James says, subject to like passions as we are. In other words, he was human. Of course, we know he was only human. <clears throat> but this is Elijah we're talking about. I can see the Jewish Christians James is writing to taken aback. What, what, do you, what do you mean? This is Elijah. That great prophet who called fire down from heaven on the evening sacrifice on Mount, on Mount Carmel. Of course, Elijah's prayers were effective, were powerful. But we do get a glimpse of the vulnerable side of Elijah. And you may remember when Elijah was on the run from Jezebel in 1 Kings 19, he asked God to take his life because God's prophets had been killed and he was the last one. He was the only one left. And so his spirit was really low as he, as he sat under the, that broom tree, as he hid in those caves. He was essentially throwing a pity party, if I can say that. <laughs> but if we were in his shoes, we'd be doing the same thing. He was a man like us. Our prayers are not powerful and effective because of anything in us. Our prayers have great power because we have a great God. And he hears us and he answers us, those that are his. Elijah prayed for many things, some of them quite extraordinary, as we see here. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. What's interesting, though, is, is James' choice of example. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, some might say that, again, Elijah prayed for many things, many extraordinary things. And, and some say that uh, James uses this example because some of these were farmers, and they could relate to this example. But... I don't believe so. James could have gone to 1 Kings 17, where the son of the widow of Zarephath was sick to the point of death, and Elijah stretches himself out. You remember the story. He stretches himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard him, and he revived the child, the scripture says. Raised him up, you might say. So this would have been the perfect example, in my mind anyway, if James was going to use an example from Elijah, especially, if this passage had to do with only physical healing. This would have been the example. But James uses 
this example of rain in which it was clearly God's will that rain would be withheld or provided. The Lord tells Elijah, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. The Apostle John writes in 1 John that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. It isn't always God's will that someone will be healed physically. Now again, we pray for that, right? Because even as we know from, from David's example, right? The child was dying and, and he prayed, prayed fervently because he said, who knows whether God will hear and answer. I'm paraphrasing there. But we don't just stop praying because we're, we're not rolling the dice with prayer, okay? God's will will be made known. And if God's will is that someone will be healed, he will accomplish that, again, through means such as prayer. But we do know it is his will that brethren dwell together in unity. And Jesus prayed that we might be one even as he and, and, and the Father are one. And I'll, I'll close with the words of Paul. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. We are able to dwell together in unity when there is mutual confession and prayer. And we need help. We need help for this. We are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We need Him to work. But we must confess our trespasses and pray for one another.